Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I am Bruce Reinig. I am the interim Thomas and Evelyn Page Dean of the Fowler College of Business at San Diego State University. Welcome to our President's Lecture Series in conjunction with the Charles W. Hostler Institute on World Affairs. We are honored to host the Hostler Institute in the Fowler College, where we take a global mindset towards all of our programs. We would like to recognize Chinye Hostler for her continued guidance and support. The Hostler Institute supports coursework and activities surrounding international diplomacy and global business, student study abroad, and international research. The Institute will be celebrating its 80th year next year in spring 2022. And I am delighted that so many of you have joined us today for this event, which is offered to our students, faculty, staff, and community in proud partnership with San Diego State University's Office of the President. So it is now my honor to introduce to you San Diego State University's President, Dr. Adela De La Torre. Dr. Adela De La Torre is the first woman and first Latina to serve as a permanently appointed president of San Diego State University. President De La Torre joined SDSU in June 2018 after a distinguished career within the California State University System, the University of Arizona, and the University of California, Davis. An accomplished economist, public health researcher and higher education leader for more than three decades, President De La Torre is known for her authenticity and collaborative approach by leading to leading by listening and example. Please join me in welcoming President Adela De La Torre. Thank you. I wanna welcome all of you to the Charles W. Hostler Institute on World Affairs President's Lecture Series. I also want to thank Mrs. Chenya Hostler for leading her generous support to make today's lecture series a reality. Chenya has long been a tremendous partner and her collaboration with our Fowler College of Business ensures we have an opportunity for timely and essential discussions across our community. These conversations are crucially important as we develop the future global citizens who will solve the world's greatest challenges. And to be clear, one of those great challenges will be how regions like San Diego and Los Angeles engage with international business, trade and tourism in sustainable ways. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, I want to share a brief history and significance of the Charles W. Hostler Institute on World Affairs. The Charles W. Hostler Institute on World Affairs plays a critical role in the educational mission of SDSU. It was founded in 1942 as the Institute on World Affairs to inform students, faculty, and the wider public on global affairs. Guided by their operating motto, let the other side be heard, the Institute has provided SDSU and the greater San Diego community with high level and spirited intellectual engagement on a rich diversity of international issues and controversies. The Institute has hosted distinguished speakers from around the world that have included ambassadors, Nobel laureates, and world leaders. The center now bears the name of Charles W. Hostler, former US ambassador to Bahrain. Ambassador Charles Hostler endowed the Institute in 2004. Now, Mrs. Hostler is working diligently to carry on his legacy of distinction and generosity. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, Council General Zheng Ping. Council General Zheng has served in diplomatic and foreign affairs roles between the people's Republic of China and the US for nearly 35 years. After five years with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the now Council General served as a council in New York for many years, and later as a director of the Department of North American and Oceanic Affairs within the Ministry of, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. 
In 2011, Consul Zhao Zheng was named the vice president of the Chinese People's Institute of Foreign Affairs. And in 2015, he was named ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary of the People's Republic of China to the Republic of Fiji. He was named to his current role as Council General in Los Angeles in 2017 and has been ardently committed to advancing business relationships, understanding, and cooperation between the two countries ever since. Notably, his role in Los Angeles covers far more than the Southern California region. The Councilor District for the Council General of Los Angeles is one of the most expansive and significant in the US and covers not only Southern California, but the state of Arizona, the state of New Mexico, the state of Hawaii, and the US Pacific Islands, including Guam, American Samoa, and the Northern Mariana Islands. The perspective, expertise, and understanding that Council Jung brings with him today is of the highest value, and it comes at a critical time in China-US relations. Please celebrate with me as we honor Council Jung Jung as a Thank you for being today's distinguished speaker. He will be presented with the STSU's Presidential Medallion. I'm honored to introduce Council John Chung and his topic for the next half hour. A new year, a new vision, China and US relations. And now a warm welcome to Council John Chung. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Respected President Delatori, Dean Reinick, faculty members and students of San Diego State University, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It gives me a great pleasure and honor to speak at the Joint Presidents and Charles Hostler Institute on World Affairs Lecture Series to share my view on China-US relations. Thank you, Madam President, and Mrs. Hostler for your kind invitation. Thank you, Madam President, for your welcoming remarks and kind introduction. SDSU and Charles Hostler Institute have a long history and a fine tradition of cultivating students' international vision and emphasizing on listening to different voices. This is very similar to the idea of openness and inclusiveness in Chinese culture. What impressed me deeply is SDSU's top ranking, both nationally and in California for the number of students participating in international exchange activities and the number of exchange programs offered to the students. This is an incredible achievement. International exchange programs help students to broaden their vision, cultivate their interest in global affairs, and elevate their ability to adapt to different cultures. This is of particular importance in the era of globalization. I would like to pay tribute to Mrs. Hostler and her late husband, Ambassador Hostler. Their contribution to education and enthusiasm for world affairs have greatly benefited the faculties and students of SDSU. 2020 was an extraordinary year. COVID-19 pandemic came all of a sudden and ravaged the world, bringing huge impact to almost every country's economic, social, and people's life. Millions of people lost their precious lives. Global economy has fallen into deep recession. The pandemic overlapping and interacting with the profound transformation and change that the world is, is experiencing has accelerated the evolution of international landscape. The global governance systems and international order are facing unprecedented challenges. The world has entered a period of uneasy transformation. 
2020 was also the most challenging year for China-US relations. While the COVID virus was encroaching upon the human health, the political virus was fanatically eroding the hard-won achievements of China-US relations. Out of its own political needs and geopolitical purpose, the US previous administration has adopted an erroneous and hostile policy toward China and resorted to every conceivable means to suppress and contain China. Some people in the United States clinging to the Cold War mentality and ideological bias took a series of actions which interfere China's internal affairs and undermine China's interests and disrupted the normal exchange and cooperation causing unprecedented damages to China-US relations and plunging the relationship into the lowest point since the establishment of diplomatic ties. New Year brings new hope. With rolling out of the COVID vaccine, we have seen, we have seen the light at the end of the tunnel. Although the pandemic is far from being over and the task of containing the pandemic remain arduous. We believe in not too distant future, humanity will eventually defeat the virus and the world will regain its vigor and vitality. The new year also ushers in a new beginning for China-US relations with the inauguration of the new US administration the relationship has come up to a new crossroad, facing with new opportunities and challenges as well. Where the relationship is heading concerning the people in both countries and the international community, we hope the relationship could be repaired and improved and go back to a predictable and constructive track of development. And the two countries could build a model of interaction that focus on peaceful existence and win-win cooperation. This is also the expectation of all other countries in the world. On the Lunar New Year's Eve, President Xi Jinping and President Biden had a long phone conversation. President Xi indicated that China is willing to work with the United States in the spirit of, non, of no conflict, no confrontation, mutual respect, and win-win cooperation to promote sound and steady development of China-US relations by focusing on cooperation and properly managing the differences. The two heads of states held the same view that two countries should enhance mutual understanding, avoid misperception, a miscalculation, treat each other with candor and sincerity and not engaged in conflict or confrontation. And that two countries should unclog communication channels and facilitate exchange and cooperation. This important phone call has pointed out the right direction for China-US relations at its critical juncture and send out the encouraging news to the whole world. The latest development is that Mr. Yang Jiechi, member of the Political Bureau of CPC Central Committee and director of the Office of the Central Commission for Foreign Affairs, and Mr. Wang Yi, State Councilor and Foreign Minister of China, will have a senior level strategic dialogue with US Secretary of State Antino, Antony Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan tomorrow in the state of Alaska. This is the first face-to-face -face senior level meeting between China and United States since the new administration took office, which is of great importance for the two sides to enhance communication and increase mutual understanding. We hope the meeting will produce positive outcomes and play this role of managing the differences and seeking cooperation to bring China-US relationship back to the right track of sound and steady development. 
However, to get China-U.S. relations back to the right track required both sides to move in the same direction. It requires both sides to take courage, demonstrate foresight, and stay in the right side of the history to make the right decision. China-U.S. relations are one of the most important bilateral relations in the world. It is the most, it is also the most complicated relationship which involves many difficult issues, both on the strategic level and on the practical level. The core issue of China-US relations is how China's development is to be perceived, whether China should be seen as a threat or as an opportunity, whether as an adversary or as a partner, whether China and United States being the two biggest countries that have different social systems and ideologies can accommodate each other and live together in peace, and whether the relationship is a zero-sum game or a win-win cooperation. At its crucial moment, as the relationship gets more complex and difficult, it is important that we manage the relationship carefully and make sure that the relationship stays on the right track. First, we need to have a correct understanding of each other's strategic intentions, prevent strategic miscalculation and avoid conflict or confrontation. Since China started reform and open up in late 1970, particularly over the last two decades, China has managed to achieve a rapid progress in its development. China now becomes the second largest economy in the world, and the momentum of growth remains strong. This has caused some anxiety among some people in the United States. They worry that China may overtake the United States and challenge the U.S. supremacy. The root cause that the previous U.S. administration has pursued misguided policy towards China is that they have made a strategic miscalculation which sees China as a major strategic competitor or even as an adversary. This is historically, fundamentally, and strategically wrong. In recent Chinese history, there was a century-long period after the Opium War in 1940, in which China remained poor and weak. China was repeatedly invaded by foreign powers and suffered accumulation of foreign bullying. This tragic experience has left a deep imprint in the memory of the Chinese people. It makes the Chinese people understand the truth that lagging behind leaves the country vulnerable and poverty leads to humiliation. It inspired the Chinese people's strong determination to strive for prosperity of the country. The pursuit of the Chinese people for nation's rejuvenation is to keep up with the pace of modernization, build a better life for their own, and prevent that part of the humiliated history from happening again. There's nothing wrong with this intention. To pursue a better life through development is the legitimate right of the Chinese people. No one has the right to deprive it. China will continue its development toward the goal of national rejuvenation. No force can hold back this process. China's development doesn't constitute any threat to any country. We stick we stick to the path of peaceful development and seek peaceful rise. China does not seek hegemony or engage in military expansion. We have no intention to challenge or replace the United States, nor do we want to compete with the United States for the dominance of the world. China's US policy is stable and consistent. 
we are prepared to work with the U.S. to move the relationship forward along the track of no conflict, no confrontation, mutual respect, and win-win cooperation. China has never provoked any dispute. However, when someone provoked the dispute, we will definitely respond. We will stand firm to, to defend our sovereignty, security, and development interests. China holds, upholds international peace and is committed to promoting the building of a community with a shared future for mankind. We will promote a new type of international relations, advocate peace, development, equity, justice, democracy, and freedom as the common values of humanity and strive for common development of humanity. China is a maintainer of international system. It advocates multilateralism, firmly upholds the international system centered on the UN and the international order underpinned by international law and the basic principles of international law and basic norms of international relations based on the purpose and principles of the UN Charter. We are against building small circles or blocks which target specific countries. These small circles or blocks are built though in the name of common values, but in fact is to seek certain countries' own interests. It will lead to split, conflict, and confrontation among international community. Second, we need to have a correct understanding of competition, rejecting Cold War mindset and zero-sum game mentality. Manage the difference properly and build a mutually beneficial relationship of win-win cooperation. Cold War has long gone. Time has changed. Cold War and zero-sum game mentality is outdated. Peace and development are the main features of present, present day world. To handle present day international relations with Cold War and zero sum mentality goes against the tide of history. China and United States may have competition, but we do not have to be adversaries. Instead, we should strive to be partners. The competition between China and the United States should be like competing with each other for excellence in a racing field, not beating, it, not beating each other on a wrestling arena. The two sides should advocate healthy competition on a fair and just basis for the purpose of self-improvement and mutual enhancement rather than finger pointing and zero sum competition we should raise our own competitiveness by managing our own business well, rather than blocking others from doing things well. More importantly, we should seek more ways for better cooperation. This should be the main goal for both China and the United States. China and the United States share many common interests. There are a wide range of areas where we can cooperate and the potential for cooperation is enormous. As President Xi pointed out in his phone conversation with President Biden, when China and United States work together, we can accomplish a great deal for the good of the both countries and the world at large. Confrontation between the two countries will definitely be disastrous. China will keep the reform and open up as its basic national policy and is committed to bringing more benefits to other countries while achieving its own development. We'll proceed with more in-depth reform and open up wider to the outside world. China is fostering a new development paradigm to adapt to the new development stage in China. We will emphasize on high quality development and promote further open up to connect the Chinese market with international market and better coordinate import and export. 
It is estimated that in the next 10 years, China will import as many as over 22 trillion US dollars of goods from foreign countries. This will bring more market opportunities to other countries and inject strong momentum to the world economy. Both sides need to get hold of these opportunities and expand practical cooperation. At present, the two countries can work together to address some of the urgent issues that confront the world, like COVID response, economic recovery, and climate change. We also need to strengthen coordination and collaboration on many international and regional hotspot issues. To facilitate bilateral cooperation, we need to create a good political environment, public opinion environment, and market environment, and avoid the abused use of national security concept and prevent political manipulation, stigmatization, and demonization. We hope that the US side will remove the unreasonable restrictions on bilateral cooperation as early as possible and not create new obstacles. Third, we need to discard ideological pre prejudice and uphold the principles of mutual respect and non-interference and properly handle those sensitive issues in the bilateral relations. Diversity is the feature of human civilization. China and the United States differ from each other in history, culture. The two countries have adopted different social systems and development paths. It is natural that two countries may have differences and dis disagreements on many things. This should not stand in the way of peaceful coexistence. Both countries should accommodate and respect the differences in each other's political and social systems. Socialism is the choice of the Chinese people. It fits Chinese national conditions. The Communist Party of China has made the pursuit of happiness for the people and of the national rejuvenation as its mission and has been working hard to serve the people and build the country. It has won the firm support of the Chinese people. Some people in the United States targeted their attacks at CPC in an attempt to sever the close ties between the CPC and the Chinese people. This will not succeed. China never interferes in internal affairs of other countries, never exports its ideology. We have no intention to engage in competition of different systems, let alone overturn the government of other countries. We are ready to have peaceful coexistence with the United States and seek common development on basis of mutual respect and seeking common ground while putting aside differences. Likewise, we hope the United States will respect China's core interests, national dignity, and rise to development. We urge the US to handle those issues which involve China's sovereignty and territorial integrity, such as Taiwan, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and Tibet with caution. These issues bear the core interests of China and touch upon the, the sentiments of 1.4 billion Chinese people. Any improper handling will create serious damage to the relationship. We hope that the US side will stop meddling in China's internal affairs and stop using this issue to hold back China's development. The question of Taiwan is the most important and sensitive core issue in China-US relations. The One China Principle is the political foundation of the relationship, a red line that cannot be transpassed or crossed. There's no room for compromise or concession from the Chinese side on that issue. The Chinese government resolve to safeguard national sovereignty 
and territorial integrity is rock firm. We hope the US side will abide by one China principle and the three Sino joint, Sino US joint communiques handle the Taiwan question prudently and properly. Issues in relation to Xinjiang, in essence, are about fighting against violence, terrorism, and separatism. The claim that there is genocide in Xinjiang couldn't be more prosperous. Preprosperous. It is just a lie fabricated with ulterior motives. Over the, over the past four decades and more, the Uyghur population in Xinjiang has more than doubled from 5.5 million to over 12 million. Between 2010 and 2018, the Uyghur population in Xinjiang increased by nearly 25%. This is far higher than the growth rate of the entire population and the Han population in Xinjiang. There are more than 24,000 mosques in Xinjiang, which means on average, there's one mosque for every 513 30 Muslims. The freedom of religious belief of all ethnic groups is well protected in accordance with law. Some Western politicians intentionally dis disregarded the basic facts and make political maneuvering in an attempt to artificially create the so-called Xinjiang issues. The, their ulterior motive is to undermine security and stability in Xinjiang and hold back Chinese development. This miscalculated attempt is doomed to fail. Hong Kong is a special administrative region of China, a part of the People's Republic of China. In recent years, Hong Kong has experienced prolonged social unrest. Violence went rampant. One of the reasons is that there are deficiencies and loopholes in Hong Kong's legal system, including its electoral system. Some forces have entered various government and legislative institutions via election and engaged in anti-China activities to disrupt Hong Kong's social order. The National People's Congress recently has a made decision to improve Hong Kong's electoral system which is, which is necessitated by the need to advance one country, two system and maintain long-term st stability in Hong Kong. It is totally constitutional, lawful and justified. Implementing the requirement of patriots and stirring Hong Kong is essential to, improve, to improving Hong Kong's electoral system Loyalty to the motherland is the basic political ethic of all public office holders and aspirants anywhere in the world. Here in the United States, citizens need to swear allegiance to the state. And for those in public offices, the requirement is more stringent. On this issue, the US side should not apply double standards, not to mention that they should not interfere. Fourth, we need to strengthen subnational cooperation and people-to-people -people exchange and build up public support of, for friendship and cooperation. Subnational cooperation and people-to-people -people exchanges constitute an important part of China-US relations. Southern California has close ties with China. Exchanges and cooperation between the two sides are extensive and in depth, which have brought tangible benefits to both our people. Before the pandemic, there were nearly 100 flights between Chinese cities and Los, An and Los Angeles every week. At its peak, the number of Chinese tourists visiting Los Angeles reached more than 1 million every year. The number of Chinese students in Southern California was as many as 40,000. 
I'm pleased to learn that about 700 Chinese students are studying in SDSU, which constitute the largest group of international students in SDSU. About one third of the cargo volume of China-US trade was handled through the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. In 2019, China was the largest trading partner of California. California had the biggest China trade volume among all the US states. And California is also the US state where Chinese companies invested most. We need to preserve such hard won outcome of China-US subnational cooperation and minimize the negative impact of the ups and downs in the political dimension of the bilateral relations. We hope that the US side will remove the stumbling blocks to people-to-people -to -people exchanges and resume the normal exchange in education, culture, and media. This is also the appeal of many people in the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, this year is of critical importance to both China and United States, as both countries are faced with important domestic agendas and policy priorities. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the founding of CPC. Also in this year, China will realize its first centenary goal of completing the building of a moderately prosperous society in all respects. Based on what we have achieved, we'll embark on a new journey of comprehensively building a modern socialist country. For China-US relations, this year marks the 50th anniversary of ping pong diplomacy and Dr. Kissinger's first visit to China. We need to sum up the experiences and draw the lessons of the past 50 years and open up a better future for the relationship. At this critical moment, we do need to ensure that the relationship heads to the right direction and we are not fall into the trap of conflict. To what direction the relationship is heading depends on what vision we have and what choices we are to make. At present, peace and development still remain the trend of our time. We have every reason to believe, no matter what challenges the relationship might encounter, so long as we have the support of our two people. The China-US relationship will have a bright future. Our two peoples should take the destiny of China-US relationship into our own hands. We need to work hard and enhance communication, promote cooperation so that we can create a bright future for our children and grandchildren. Let's work together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Consul General Zhang, for giving us comprehensive overview and sharing your perspectives with us today. We do have some questions prepared for you focused on economic uh, partnership, which I would like to, to begin. Uh, the first question is that we understand trade policy happens in stages. What do you anticipate as a phase two trade deal between the United States and China and if so, what might it, or I should say, uh, in, in what do you imagine it might include? Oh, um, since uh, the first free uh, trade agreement uh, went effect uh, uh, in uh, February last year, and the uh, both sides have, uh, say, uh, promote the implementation of the agreement uh, pretty well we believe, and the Chinese side has strengthened the IPR protection, uh, expand the uh, market access for food and agricultural products, and also open up China's financial market. So uh, the US side has also implemented 
its obligation to open up some of the agricultural, say, a market to Chinese products, and also has exempted the uh, some of the tariffs imposed on Chinese uh, products. So uh, I think, generally speaking, the first phase uh, agreement are being implemented pretty well. Of course, uh, we have the factor of the uh, pandemic last year, which uh, slowed the uh, process of uh, import. Uh, I think uh, the uh, progress has been uh, recognized uh, by the US side and the, uh, the, the, the US uh, uh, Trade Representative Office and also Agriculture Department have all made the remarks to uh, recognize the progress of the implementation. So uh, I think uh, obviously we'll continue the uh, trade relationship with the United States as we believe uh, the trade relationship is very important to both countries. And also there is a great potential for developing the trade. I think although uh, last year uh, there was the uh, pandemic However, uh, the uh, trade volume still is pretty large. The uh, bilateral trade volume has reached about 580 billion US, uh, uh, 580 billion US dollars, uh, which is an increase of uh, over 8%. And also uh, the China's imports from United States also reached um, 234 billion US dollars and almost a 10% increase. So I think uh, we will continue, I mean, to expand the trade. And also uh, uh, we think, uh, uh, say uh, at present stage, uh, it is important that both sides resume the uh, dialogue and also uh, say, uh, take off the export control uh, and also those kind of uh, tariff measures that has been posed on the bilateral trade and also stop using some of the, uh, say, uh, sanction measures, yeah, to, uh, and also discriminatory measures, yeah, to crack down on Chinese uh, enterprises. So I think uh, uh, to create a kind of good atmosphere for the next phase uh, agreement uh, is very important. Okay, thank you so much. I, I have a, my next question is on topic that we visited a little bit about, uh, briefly about before your presentation, where we talked about uh, electrical vehicles in China and that trend. Um, at San Diego State University, our students, faculty, and administration value sustainability and efforts to combat climate change. Would you please share with us what steps China is taking to address climate change? <laughs> Well, uh, obviously, I think uh, we are now paying uh, great attention to the issues of sustainable development and also ecological, say, uh, conservation. And uh, we think uh, uh, there's a one human being simply share one planet Earth. It is important that every country do, does its effort yeah, to promote uh, the conservation and protection of the planet Earth. And China has uh, also made great efforts to promote ecological progress. And we have taken concrete actions on global climate, say, governance. And uh, together with the United States, I think uh, we have made contribution uh, to the uh, establishment of a Paris uh, Agreement on Climate Change. And now I think uh, we are also promoting the philosophy of uh, promoting, say, a green development. And we believe, uh, as President Xi said, that blue waters and green mountains are indeed golden and civil mountains. So I think uh, this is a kind of a vision and kind of a policy orientation that has been deeply say, embedded in Chinese uh, policies. And uh, we have noticed that uh, almost every 
provinces and every cities are emphasizing on the green development. And China has also scaled up the all, say uh, the uh, NDC, that is uh, the nationally, um, the, uh, the, the, the nationally, uh, uh, we, we have also made the uh, promise that uh, we will receive, uh, we will say meet the uh, carbon peak by 2030 and carbon neutral by uh, 2060. So, uh, so this shows uh, China's uh, strong commitment to implementing the uh, new development philosophy and building a clean and beautiful China. So I think uh, we'll continue to follow these uh, principles and uh, we will work together with international community on climate change issues. And we believe uh, the climate change issue is an area that China, United States can work together. Terrific, thank you. Would you please explain what China's objectives are with the Belt and Road Initiative, which we hear much about, and how will the recipient countries, which tend to be developing, address the associated debt? Well, I think uh, uh, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, was uh, proposed uh, by President Xi uh, in uh, 2013. And uh, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, is uh, the kind of initiative that is aimed at bring uh, the uh, relevant countries and regions together, yeah, to uh, uh, enhance the connectivity and economic uh, integration. And, uh, and also I think we emphasize on the, uh, say, complementarity of the policies and, uh, and also on the trade and the cultural exchanges. And I think uh, we follow the uh, principle of uh, uh, mutual consul uh, the, uh, the, we, we follow the uh, principle of uh, 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 consultation uh, and uh, shared benefits and joint contribution. Yeah, extensive consultation, joint uh, contribution and shared benefits. I think uh, these are the principles. So I think uh, when we conduct these kind of projects and obviously uh, we do lots of consultation with the country's concern and we do lots of feasibility study. So right now over 100 countries uh, and dozens of international organizations have signed up uh, for the uh, BR cooperation, say, projects. So uh, some countries have built their first expressway or modern railway, and some have developed their first automobile manufacturers. So we see the actual results are coming out, and uh, we see the Belt and Road initiative has contributed to the econ economic growth of these countries. And uh, we uh, believe uh, the uh, so-called debt trap, I think is groundless. And uh, so uh, some, uh, uh, I think uh, already uh, lots of uh, countries have uh, use their own experience to uh, say, uh, refute these kind of uh, allegations. And, uh, and the, uh, the uh, uh, because I think uh, these projects, uh, many of these projects are on the long-term sort of uh, loans and uh, the loans also with low interest. And so, uh, I, I, and also I think uh, most importantly, these kind of project, projects help uh, these countries development. So uh, we have also 
uh, so find out measures, I mean, to exempt some of the, uh, say, uh, interest free loans of African countries, uh, say, which become mature uh, by last year. So I think uh, we have, uh, say, done a great deal to promote cooperation. Yeah. And we welcome, say, uh, I think, uh, so, uh, so I think we will continue uh, to push the uh, Belt and Road Initiative and cooperate uh, with other countries. Thank you so much. And, and when you reflect on this, this trend towards economic development, this initiative and, and others, and reflect on your own position as Consul General, um, and reflect on the skills that, that you've needed to move forward into your, in your career, um, I would ask for you to address our students uh, with the question, what advice would you give the students that are here today and they're seeking to prepare themselves for an internationally competitive job market? Well, uh, I think, uh, uh, how to say, according to, based on my experience uh, as a diplomat, I think uh, there are many things that, uh, that we can share uh, uh, I think uh, being a diplomat, uh, first of all, you represent your country and your government. So the sort of, uh, say, uh, loyalty, patriotic uh, is important. Yeah. And you have to, say, defend interests of your country. Yeah. And uh, the second thing, I think uh, you have to understand the world understand your country and so that you can represent your country well. You can tell your story, explain your position in a better way. Yeah. And I, third, I think uh, you have to have a sort of uh, international vision. Yeah, you, when you look at things, uh, it's not only about yourself. You have to look at the relevant factors that affect uh, the things which goes on. So I think it's really important that you have a sort of international vision as you promote uh, among your students. And, uh, and, and also I think equipped yourself with the knowledge about international affairs. And I think uh, another thing is about the communication skill. Uh, I think especially when you deal with uh, cultural, uh, uh, when you deal with people of different cultures and different from different countries, it's better that you understand the culture, yeah, and uh, you uh, develop the, uh, the ability, yeah, to communicate. So in that case, uh, foreign language uh, and learning the different cultures is very important, yeah. I started learning English from the uh, primary school, yeah, uh, from very young age. And I think uh, it helps me a lot in my career development, yeah. So that's why I think, uh, say, institutions like Confucius Institute, which uh, teach uh, languages, helps a lot, yeah, for the uh, American students, yeah, to learn the foreign language. and to know about foreign cultures. And, uh, and another thing I think uh, is the, uh, say, uh, dedication. And uh, diplomatic job is, how to say, is very exhausted. Yeah, and you have to work all the time. Yeah, so I think uh, that requires you to work very hard and dedicate it, your time, energy, I mean, to do a better job. So I think uh, there are lots of things that the young students could cultivate, I mean, uh, from the very young age, yeah, to prepare uh, themselves for a good, say, career future. Thank you for that answer. That, that, um, 
that emphasis on a global mindset and language skills developments are key components uh, of our programs, a particular international business program. Um, Consul General, we are we are about out of out of time. Do you have any final comments you would like to share with our audience today? Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation and uh, for giving me the opportunity to share the views uh, on uh, China-U.S. relationship, uh, which is very important uh, at this critical moment. And uh, of course, uh, we think the bilateral relationship, uh, say, bears the interests of uh, both countries, as well as the interest of the uh, whole world. So I think it's important that we uh, say uh, steer the course in the right direction. And uh, currently there are lots of uh, difficulties that need uh, our two peoples to overcome together. So we think communication is very important and uh, and exchange our views will help understand each other better. So we very much look forward to the future opportunities to, uh, to exchange views and to communicate and also to promote mutual understanding and friendship. So I think I look forward to uh, working with you uh, to better communicate uh, the important issues that we are concerned about. Thank you, Consul General Zhang. We, we sincerely appreciate you joining us and sharing your views and making this informative presentation. I would also like to thank President De La Torre, Chinye Hostler, and the Charles W. Hostler Institute on World Affairs for hosting this timely and relevant event. Uh, we look forward to all our students, faculty, and community members joining us again for future events such as this one. This now concludes our program. Thank you. Thank you.